Well, good evening, everyone. I look forward to our conversation this evening. There's widespread agreement on these basic tenets about climate change. Surface temperatures have increased since 1880. Humans are adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. And carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases have a warming effect on the planet. However, there's substantial disagreement about the issues of greatest consequence. Whether the recent warming has been dominated by human causes, how much the planet will warm in the 21st century, whether warming is dangerous, and how we should respond to the warming. Now, there's nothing wrong or bad about scientific disagreement. In fact, the scientific process thrives in the face of disagreement, which motivates regarding the disagreement on causes of climate change. On the left-hand side is the perspective of a stable changes in response to changes in atmospheric CO2. In other words, carbon dioxide is the climate control knob. It's a simple and seductive idea. However, some scientists think that this is a misleading oversimplification. They regard climate as a complex, nonlinear, dynamical system with no simple cause and effect. Climate can shift naturally in unexpected ways owing to natural internal variability associated with large-scale ocean circulations. Now, these two perspectives are not mutually exclusive. Proponents of the natural variability arguments acknowledge the impact of CO2, but consider it to be a modest wedge that projects onto the natural modes of climate variability. The point of this cartoon is that if you only look at one part of the elephant, you will misdiagnose. You need to look at the entire elephant. And the bottom line is that we don't yet have a unified theory of climate variability and change that integrates all this in a predictive sense. Scientific debate actually matter? Well, yes, it does. If you assume that carbon dioxide is a control knob for climate, then you can control climate by reducing CO2 emissions. But if you assume that climate change primarily occurs naturally, then the Earth's climate is largely uncontrollable, and reducing CO2 emissions will do little or nothing to change the climate. My personal assessment aligns with the right-hand side, emphasizing natural variability. However, the IPCC and the so-called consensus aligns with the left-hand side. About, up until about 10 years ago, I also aligned with the left-hand side because I saw supporting the IPCC consensus was a responsible thing to do. Here is how and why I changed my mind. In 2010, I started digging deeper, both into the science itself and the politics that were shaping the science. I came to realize that the policy cart was way out in front of the scientific horse. The 1992 UN Climate Change Treaty was signed by 190 countries before the balance of scientific evidence suggested even a discernible human influence on the global climate implemented before we had any confidence that most of the warming was caused by humans. There was tremendous political pressure on the IPCC scientists to present findings that would support these treaties, and this resulted in a manufactured consensus. Here's how the so-called consensus and increasing confidence in human-caused global warming became a self-fulfilling prophecy. You find what you shine a light on, in other words, we've only been looking at one part of the elephant. Motivated by the UN Climate Treaty and the IPCC and government funding, climate scientists have focused primarily on human-caused climate change. Other factors important for understanding climate variability and change have been relatively neglected. I've highlighted long-term ocean oscillations and solar indirect effects since I think these are potentially very important on decadal to century timescales. One of the most consequential impacts of a warming climate is sea level rise. These two statements by climate scientists typify the alarm over sea level rise. The first is a statement by Dr. Jim Hansen. That's the big thing, sea level rise. The planet could become ungovernable. The second is a statement by Dr. Michael Mann. We're talking about literally giving up on our coastal cities of the world and moving inland. 
Is this alarm justified by the evidence? This figure illustrates the challenge of attributing long-term sea level rise to CO2 emissions. The blue curve shows sea level change since 1800 measured from tide gauges. The red curve shows global emissions of carbon dioxide from burning of fossil fuels. You can see that global sea levels were rising steadily long before fossil fuel emissions became substantial. You can also see that the steep increase in emissions following 1950 is associated with very little sea level rise between 1950 and 1990. Now an uptick in sea level rise occurred in the 1990s, which is circled. Let's take a closer look to see what's causing this. Since 1993, global satellite data have provided valuable information about sea level variations and glacier mass balance. This figure shows a recent analysis of the budget of sea level rise since 1993. You can see that the overall rate of sea level rise has increased since 1993. But what's causing the increase? The turquoise region on the bottom of the diagram relates directly to expansion from warming. But you actually see a decrease until about 2009. Now this has been attributed to the cooling impact following the eruption of Mount Pinatubo in 1992. What stands out as causing the increase in the rate of sea level rise is the growing contribution from Greenland, which is a dark blue area on top. Hence the increase in the rate of sea level rise is caused by Greenland melting. So is the Greenland melting caused by increasing CO2 emissions? The top figure shows the Greenland mass balance for the 20th century. Ice sheet mass balance is defined as the increase from snowfall minus the decrease from melting. You can see the negative mass balance values after 1995, reflecting mass loss that raises sea level. But if you look earlier, in the record, you see even larger negative values, particularly in the 1920s and 1930s. Clearly, the high mass loss rates of recent years are not unprecedented, even in the 20th century. Greenland was anomalously warm in the 1930s and 1940s. What caused this? The bottom figure shows variations in the Atlantic multidecadal oscillation which is an important mode of natural internal climate variability. In general, years with positive AMO index are associated with a mass loss for Greenland, whereas negative AMO index is associated with a mass gain. From this analysis, I can only conclude that CO2 emissions are not the main cause of sea level rise since the mid-19th century. The scientific evidence that I've shown you on the preceding slides is well known to the IPCC. Here are some statements that the most recent IPCC report made on sea level change in Greenland. Recent rates of sea level rise are comparable to those that were observed between 1920 and 1950. Recent temperatures and mass loss from Greenland are comparable to what was seen in the 1930s. Detection of the impact of human-caused warming and observed changes in regional sea level remains challenging. Now, I've been asked to respond to the question, to what extent are man-made CO2 emissions contributing to climate change? The short answer is we don't know. And the reason that we don't know is because we don't know how to disentangle natural internal variability from the effects of CO2-driven warming. Even the IPCC doesn't claim to know exactly. The most recent IPCC assessment report says it's extremely likely to be more than half. More than half is not very precise. Given the IPCC's neglect of multidecadal and longer time scales of natural internal variability, I regard the extreme confidence of their conclusion to be unjustified. So here's my personal assessment. Man-made CO2 emissions are as likely as not to contribute less than 50% of the recent warming. Why? If you believe that climate model, even if you believe climate model projections, there's still genuine disagreement regarding whether a rapid acceleration away from fossil fuels is the appropriate policy response. One side argues that reducing CO2 emissions is critical for preventing future dangerous warming of the climate. 
The other side argues that any reduction in warming would be minimal and at high cost, and that the cure could be worse than the disease. What makes most sense to me is climate pragmatism, which has been formulated by the Hartwell Group. Climate pragmatism has three pillars. Accelerate energy innovation, build resilience to extreme weather, and no regrets pollution reduction. These policies provide near-term socioeconomic and environmental benefits and have justifications independent of climate mitigation and adaptation. These are no regrets policies that do not require agreement about climate science or the risks of uncontrolled greenhouse gases. I would like to make a few comments on the state of the scientific and public debate on climate change. Here's my take on the madhouse effect. The madhouse that concerns me is the one that has been created by some climate scientists. The madhouse is characterized by rampant overconfidence in an overly simplistic theory of climate change, enforcement of a politically motivated manufactured consensus, attempts to stifle scientific and policy debates, activism and advocacy for their preferred politics and policy, self-promotion and cashing in, and public attacks on other scientists that do not support the consensus. Hmm, maybe I should write a book. In closing, I would like to make a personal statement to clarify my motives. I regard my job as a scientist to critically evaluate evidence and to continually challenge and reassess conclusions that are drawn from the evidence. A year ago, I resigned my tenured faculty position because of academic political pressures that interfered with doing my job. My resignation was a direct result of the science madhouse effect discussed on the previous slide. I'm now working in the private sector as president of Climate Forecast Applications Network. My direct engagement with the public is via my blog, Climate Etc., where we discuss a broad range of topics related to climate science and policy. All viewpoints and perspectives are welcome. I hope that you'll join us at judithcurry.com. Thank you. Um, equilibrium climate sensitivity is, is a sort of a metric for how much warming would you get if you double carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and you allow the climate to equilibrate for you know some hundreds of years. Um, there's a great deal of uncertainty in that parameter. Um, the latest IPCC report gave a likely range between 1.5 and 4.5 degrees centigrade, and that range has been pretty much unchanged um, for some decades now. But there's still um, a lot of evidence supporting values outside those ranges on both ends. Okay, so there's a great deal of uncertainty. Now, climate models have an average equilibrium sensitivity of about 3.2, and it's a much narrower range, and it's on the higher end of that. And so when you project into the um, 21st century with these climate models, you're really only getting the high end of things, not what it would be if the sensitivity was on the lower end. So this is sort of a logical inconsistency, um, you know, in the the conclusions, in my opinion, because there's this great deal of uncertainty about equilibrium climate sensitivity, but the climate models are on one end of this, and the projections are then, you know, on the high end relative to what the lower values of equilibrium climate sensitivity would suggest. So it's still a lot of uncertainty there. Well, plants clearly like more CO2 in terms of the climate, um, we really have no idea. Um, I, I've always been puzzled by why people think that somehow pre-industrial conditions, say mid-18th um, century, was sort of the baseline. Well, for, that was low CO2, but it was really, really cold. It was in the I think, Valley Forge. I mean, is that the climate we want? No. Um, and climate is not stable. All of that happened independent of CO2 higher causing anything. There were other causes besides CO2. CO2 might have responded. So climate fundamentally isn't stable. So um, we just have to learn to live with whatever kind of climate we get and to the
Well, you've just seen the climate science madhouse in action. Okay? Um, this is a very, very complex issue, both the science and the <coughs> socioeconomic impacts and the options for policy response. My concern is that we have vastly oversimplified both the problems and its solutions. And by insisting that there is no debate about the science, by insisting that there is only one path to solving this, is a recipe for disaster. We will be surprised. We will make mistakes along the way. And fundamentally, we just need to learn to live with whatever is going to come our way. This is what um, human societies has always done. This is what ecosystems has, have always done. And it's the job of scientists to try to understand all this and be as unbiased and objective as they can and to learn through disagreement and to really push the knowledge frontier by trying to enforce this overly simplistic so-called consensus. We're not going to get anywhere. So um, we need to open up the debate on both the science and the policy options if we're going to make any progress on this. Thank you.